God has commissioned Pastor Vera or Robert to preach the word of faith, ushering people into the life of limitless abundance. Get ready for an encounter that will enable you to obtain all of God's blessings for your life. Glory to the name of Jesus. You are all welcome tonight in Jesus' name. We are really excited about what the Lord is doing. We are excited about the workings of His Spirit in our midst. We are excited that the Lord keeps showing us step by step things concerning his plans and his purpose for our lives. And we thank him that he's given us ears to hear. Amen. Amen. And he's given us hearts to understand. This evening, I want to specially welcome all of you to this service. This is a very special service. Amen. This is a very special service. If you are not carrying a baby or anything and you are in that last flank, can you move in somewhere here? Just move in here. So I don't need to be doing 360 degrees. And if you are not carrying a baby and you are at the back, you move forward as well. All right, praise God. You know that last week we were talking about Jesus and we're looking at Jesus as what? Eh? My shepherd. He's my shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And we saw all the di dimensions of his being our shepherd. And that because of that, we are never alone. We are never without God. And so we are never without help. I wanted to say, I'm never without help. Because I'm never without God. Say one more time, I'm never without help because I'm never without God. So he said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Today I was going to talk about Jesus, the life, but in the past few days, the Lord has been ministering uh, to me in a, a different direction. So I'm going to take that on Sunday. This evening, I want to uh, deal on a, a, a little bit on spiritual warfare. I want to deal a little bit on spiritual warfare. You know, many times when people are dealing with spiritual conflicts, they may not even know that they are dealing with serious spiritual conflicts in their lives. They just think that things are just happening the way it's just happening like that. They don't know it's spiritual conflict. And there are some things the Lord was showing me that necessitated this message tonight because several, as a ministry, of course, um, we are going to really rise up in spiritual warfare at this time. But even as an individual, I want to know that sometimes you can be in the midst of a spiritual conflict and not know. All life is spiritual. All life is spiritual. And there are certain things that will be taking place, you just assume it's normal. God is saying that it's time, at this time, for you to arise to handle some things very seriously in the realm of the spirit. Praise God. Of course, you know that in the Old Testament, people were involved in spiritual conflicts. They didn't know. Daniel was praying 21 days. He didn't know that there was a demon somewhere holding his prayer. He was in a serious spiritual battle. He didn't know it. Not that he wasn't praying. Not that God didn't hear his prayer. But there was a demonic entity sitting over that prayer and saying, this prayer is not going to, the answer is not going to get down to you. So things like that happen in the realm of the spirit. And that is why the message I want to bring tonight, I want you to know that it's, a very, it's very much a now word. It's not just a teaching for you to just write and put in your jota. It's a now word for you to rise up. And as the word will be coming, the energy to rise up, to do warfare, we come with it. In the name of Jesus. And uh, in dealing with the issue of uh, spiritual warfare, I'd like us to start from Second Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2. Verse 11. 2 11. Find it in your Bible. 2 Corinthians 2 11. If you have never underlined it in your Bible, I want you to underline it. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11. Okay, we are studying tonight and then we are going to spend a few minutes to pray before we go. I want you to read everybody 
2 Corinthians 2 11, 1 to read. He said, Lest Satan should get an advantage, to gain an advantage over us. We don't want Satan to gain an advantage over us. So there is a way we can act that can make the devil gain an advantage, an undue advantage over us. Why? If we become ignorant of his devices. If we become ignorant of his workings. And it's so sad to see that there are some Christians who don't believe in the devil. They don't believe in a real devil. There are people who think that the devil is just a figment of somebody's imagination. The thing about it is that if you don't believe in the devil, it means you don't believe in God. Okay? Because God was the one in his world who told us about the devil. How the devil came about. All the things he's doing. And all his methods, his methodias that he employs to try to hinder the purpose of God in your life. I want you to know that one of the serious things that the devil tries to do in every life is to hinder you from entering into the purpose of God. Is to paralyze you from fully entering into your place in life. That's one of the serious, serious issues that the devil has forefront and center. How do I hinder this person? So the Bible says he's going up and down, in and out, here and there. He's looking for destinies to destroy. That's what he's at. Okay? And so tonight, in doing this study, I'm just praying that you will rise up to know that this devil is real. And I must take my stand against him. Say amen. amen. I must take my stand against him. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Moses was the one that was recounting all of these stories. Then in Deuteronomy 2 verse 24... He said, see what God told him. He said, God told him to rise up. Rise ye up. Take your journey. Pass over the river Anon. Behold, I have given unto thine hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. You know, anytime I read that scripture, it appears like there is a contradiction. And I want us to look at it very close. Please, this fan is disturbing me. I want us to look at it very closely tonight. Chapter 2, verse 24. It says, Behold, I have given unto thy hand Sihon the Ammonite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. First of all, God says, I have given you Sihon. I have given you his land. He should have stopped there. But he didn't stop there. I have given you. The next thing he said, contend with him in battle. In other words, even though I have given you the land, there's a part for you to play. There's something for you to do. There needs to be a contention. When we were leaving NRA Junction, the Lord spoke to us. And I shared it with, with all of us. That the Lord said to us that all this while you have been fighting the battle for passage. You remember? He said, now that you are moving in here, you are fighting the battle for possession. That's what happened to the children of Israel. All the while they were in the wilderness, they were fighting battles for passage. But as soon as they crossed the Jordan into the Canaan, they began to fight the battle for possession. Even though God said, I have given you this land, the land was there, but they had to contend for it. They had to fight for it. So Apostle Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Any believer who is not ready to fight is not ready to win. Any believer who is not ready to fight is not ready to win. It was Jesus himself who said, the kingdom of God from the days of John the Baptist up to now, the kingdom of God does what? Suffers violent. The violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. So if you want to just roll over and play dead or hope that somehow, somehow things will change tomorrow, I want you to know that we are, play, we are fighting with a, we are dealing with a demon and a devil who does not play fair. So you must know what you are supposed to do as a child of God and begin to contend with him in battle. I have given you the land, but begin to contend. May I tell you that every inheritance that Jesus died to purchase for you, the devil is going to try to sit over it. It is you that will tell him, you cannot sit over my inheritance. You cannot sit over my inheritance. 
You cannot sit over my inheritance. When Jesus died, Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the cause. Being made a cause for us, as it is written, cause is everyone that hangeth on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham may come to us, the Gentiles. Okay? And we, we've taught over and over again, I'm not going to go into that teaching, that when it says Christ redeemed us, he redeemed us from the cause. Threefold cause. He redeemed us from the cause of death. So for death, he gave us eternal life. He redeemed us from the cause of sickness and disease. So for sickness, he gave, gave us health. He redeemed us from the cause of poverty. For poverty, he gave us wealth and abundance. Now, so, but if you don't stand up to take your own, you are going to suffer and die in poverty, and you will think that that's how God wants it. You think that that's just how it's supposed to be. No. If Jesus purchased it for you, it is your duty to contend to collect what is yours. Am I making sense tonight? Okay, so the Holy Spirit is going to be helping us. Go to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49. I'm stirred in my spirit tonight. Amen. I'm really stirred because I know somebody is about to rise up in this place. Uh, somebody is about to say, enough is enough, Satan. Enough is enough. Isaiah 49 verse 25. 49.25 He said, But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contends with you, and I will save your children. So here was speaking by the, the, the prophet to the Old Testament saints. He said, I will contend with them that contend with you. Old Testament. Please remember this Old Testament. I will contend with them that contend with you. I will contend with them that contend with you. But in the New Testament, God is not necessarily contending with our contenders. I will explain. Because he has already contended for us. Amen. He has already contended for us. He has already won the battle for us. So God is not expecting that you come and call him to contend. Because he already won the battle. Kenneth Hagin was sharing how one day... He was praying and then the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And Jesus appeared to him several times in his life and ministry. And you see, these, these, things, that are, that these things are real. Spiritual things are real. Spiritual things are real. Amen. Spiritual things are real. I don't want you to live your Christian life as if spiritual things are not real. Spiritual things are real. And so, as he was... Uh, as Jesus appeared to him, Jesus was telling him about demons and demonic um, activities and how to deal with them. All of a sudden, in the midst of that conversation, a demon just jumped in between him and Jesus. And the demon started making noise, shouting, put out one smoke like this. He couldn't see Jesus clearly again. And he couldn't hear what Jesus was saying. But Jesus didn't stop. Jesus went right on talking and explaining. And he was waiting for Jesus to rebuke the devil. Uh-uh. Does he not see that this demon is disturbing us? Jesus did not do anything. Went right on talking as if he couldn't see the demon. Kenneth Hagin said he got to one place where he became angry in his spirit. That I, I, I'm missing out on what Jesus is saying and he's not stopping. He just got angry and said, I rebuke you, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And that demon just fell down. And there was whimpering on the ground. He said, not only just get out of here. So after the demon cleared off, he started asking Jesus, excuse me sir, why did you not cast him out. And Jesus said to him, I could not. He said, no, I don't understand. You mean, you didn't want to? He said, no, I could not. Please, what's the meaning of could not? I wasn't able to. He said, he said I, I know you are Jesus that appeared to me, but you have to show me scriptures to prove this because I just can't accept that there's something Jesus cannot do. How can you say you, you could not? So Jesus started explaining to him using about three or four scriptures to explain to him that see he has given him authority over demonic spirits and that it was not his place to rebuke that demon. He has given him authority to rebuke the demon. Amen. So he began to speak in Isaiah 49 that I will contend with your contenders but let me show you Isaiah go to Isaiah chapter 9 Isaiah chapter 9 Some of you are waiting for, the, for God to rise up to deal with the devil for you. It's not going to happen. 
You are going to wait for a long time. God is not going to rise up to do anything about the devil because what he has to do with the devil, he has already done. Let me show you what he did. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 5. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now what is he saying? He said normally if you look at every physical battle, it's with confused noise. Verse 5. Every battle. If you watch any war film, you see there's a lot of noise in war. Confused noise. And with garments rolled in blood. I was watching a documentary of um, Alexander the Great uh, two nights ago. Very interesting documentary. Okay? A lot of war, a lot of blood everywhere. He said every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and with garments rolled in blood. But look at what he says in that verse. He said, but this. So when he said, but this, it means there is another kind of battle. Amen? So he first of all talk about natural battle which is with confused noise and garments rolled with blood. He said, but there is another battle, and this one shall be with burning and fuel of fire. This shall be with burning and fuel of fire, for unto us a child is born. So in contending with our contenders, what God introduced was Jesus Christ. Amen. In contending, in this battle that, we are, that is raging, what God introduced was Jesus Christ. In sending Jesus... He actually came to deal with the contender once and for all. And then he begins to show us what to do from then on. If you follow me so far, say amen. amen. So when you read the Bible, we, we see that we are in warfare. How many of you understand that we are in battle, we are in warfare? Uh, if you don't know that, then <laughs> there's a serious problem. We are in warfare, but we already have the victory. Amen. amen. It's a warfare where we already have the victory is a spiritual warfare and it is real. We are commanded in scriptures to deal with spiritual entities that are arrayed against us. We are commanded to deal with them. We are commanded to deal with them. We are commanded to deal with them. There's no place in the Bible where you will ever read where God said you should pray to him to come and deal with the devil for you. There's no place in the, in the Bible. There's no place in the Bible where you will read that you, God will somehow come from heaven to come and help you handle the uh, demonic issues. There's no place in scriptures. Okay, so we are going to use the next few minutes to look at the fact that many people are held in bondage. Today, many people are held in bondage. Of course, we know from Colossians that Christ has already delivered us from the powers of darkness. Do we know that? Yes? Not that he's trying to deliver us. He has already delivered us. That's what Colossians 1, 12 and 13 says. He has already delivered us. But if you don't know this, please, I want us to read that Colossians. Let me not assume everybody knows. Let's go small, small, so that when we get to the point of contending, you know what you are doing tonight. Colossians. Chapter 1. Verse 12. Colossians 1, 12. He said, giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet or fit or qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Verse 13. Everybody read verse 13. Please, when you say he has delivered us, is that future tense? Huh? It's something he has already done. He has already delivered us. He is not trying to deliver us. He will not deliver us if we pray very hard. The Bible says he already delivered us from the powers of darkness. Now, so there are certain things that Christ has done for us. If you don't know it, it will be as if he didn't do it. He says, My people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. He says, It's true knowledge that my righteous servant be delivered. Okay, so. You find out that over and over again, the devil brings attacks against us. He brings attacks against our health. 
attacks against our relationships, against our families, against so many things, our finances. The devil keeps working and working relentlessly. And he doesn't get tired of working. He doesn't get tired of working. The devil is relentless. He never stops. And in working, what he tries to do is to destabilize you. The devil wants to destabilize you. He wants to destabilize you so that you become unfruitful in life. He wants to destabilize you so that you can become unproductive in the purpose of Christ. He wants to destabilize you so that you, you just live this wandering, meandering life. That is his purpose. The devil wants to destabilize you. I was reading something somebody posted on our WhatsApp group, one of my, our group chats today, and, you know, it was talking about one uh, young man who was uh, working in a church. And when they posted a new pastor, is that those kind of churches they post pastors in, in the UK? Okay, they posted this new pastor to the church, and the new pastor came with a policy that the least person who can work in that church must be, must have secondary school, at least. If not, you cannot work there. And this young man who was cleaning the church did not do that. And now he has passed the age. He thinks he can go back to school. So the pastor told him that, well, I'll give you six months. You go back to school or you resign. And he knew that he couldn't go back to school. So he resigned. And one day he said he was just moving on uh, Ox Bond Street in the, in, in the UK, in London. As he was moving on Bond Street, all of a sudden, he's supposed to be a Christian. No? All of a sudden, he just felt this strong urge to smoke because he was feeling frustrated. And he walked all around the Bond Street. He couldn't find any kiosk to get a cigarette. He moved to the next street. There was no kiosk. An idea occurred to him that there must be people like this who have been needing cigarettes that can't find. So the next thing he went to get a small kiosk on Bot Street and started selling and he was making money. Then he built another kiosk, built another kiosk and he became for those of you who know about cigarette things, there's this cigarette called uh, is it Dunhill? Huh? Okay, so that's this brother's, this supposed brother that time was Dunhill. And then um um one day he had he wanted to sign a contract for all the um, people who grow tobacco they were to sign a contract and then as they were signing the contract the man who came for the for on the other side noticed that he couldn't sign a signature he used his thumb to sign and the man said wow just imagine that uh, someone like you who didn't go to school can have has made so much progress so much money and you can't even sign your signature. Huh? Suppose you go to school. I wonder where you will be. So he said he looked at the man and said, Suppose I go to school, I will see the clean church. As I not go to school, that's why. And the person who posted it, posted it like it was a great achievement. Uh -huh, it was a great achievement. See, he has made money now. What this young man didn't know is that the devil set things in motion to destabilize his life. So now he has made a lot of money, he thinks he has arrived. But the thing about it, he has been destabilized from his destiny. And the devil pushed him into an arena where he is not only destroying his life, he's going to destroy millions of other lives. He thinks he's making progress. So when the devil comes at us, usually he comes in our minds most of the time. I told you the other time that when the temptation came against Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, and the Bible says, the devil told him, if you are the son of God, command these stones. It's not as if there was a physical devil with two horns and a long tail who said, come here, see, see, see. Everything that Jesus experienced is just the way the devil tells us today. It was right here. It was right here. It was right here. It was right here. Just the way the devil tells us today. And may I inform you tonight that the whole purpose of the devil is to destabilize you so that you will not be fruitful in life, to destabilize you so that you will not be productive in the purpose of Christ. I want to show you Mark chapter 3. Go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. I want to look at verse 27. That story also is in Matthew 12, but I want to show you from Mark 
chapter 3. You know, they were accusing Jesus that he was casting out devils by the prince of the devils. Okay? And look at what he said in Mark chapter 3, verse 27. He said, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his goods. Now, because Jesus was casting out demons, I'm going to show you two things out of this scripture. The second one, the Lord just showed me a few days ago. I never saw it before, reading out of that scripture. When Jesus said, because Jesus was casting out demons, dealing with them anyhow, he said, you cannot enter into a strong man's house until you first bind that strong man. So what Jesus was actually saying is that, see, I'm stronger than the devil. If I'm able to cast him out, it means I'm stronger than him. Right? It means I'm stronger than him. So I want you to know that the one that lives in us is greater than he that is in the world. The one that lives in us is greater than he. I don't ever want you to forget that in your life. I don't ever want you to forget that in your entire life. That the one that is with us is more than they that, is, that are with them. So that's the first thing. That Jesus said, I am casting out devils because I'm stronger than him. But then secondly, let me show you what God showed me out of that scripture. Anytime the devil wants to destabilize a life, the first thing he tries to do is to bind that life. Anytime the devil wants to destabilize any life, the first thing he tries to do is to bind that life. And because he cannot bind a Christian, what he does is to bring thoughts, worry, thoughts of fear, thoughts of doubt and unbelief. And once you begin to accept that, you begin to accept that, what begins to happen is that he begins to get an inroad. Gradually, he's destabilizing you. Destabilizing your faith. All of a sudden, you even forget who you are. All of a sudden, you forget the, the power that you carry within. You forget the greater one that is inside. Then you are beginning to look at the situation. You are looking at, the devil begins to point you to all kinds of things going on. Anytime the devil wants to spoil a life, the first thing he does is to try to bind that person. And let me tell you one of his greatest strategies. The devil uses what I normally call the strategy of isolation. It's a very powerful strategy that he uses. He tries to isolate the Christian. You know, I like to watch all these animals, something from time to time. These animal films. You know, the lion is not the biggest animal. Eh? Is it the biggest animal in the jungle? No, it's not. But he says it's the strongest, the most ferocious when the lion wants to kill, you see some of these animals with big, big horns? If they really settle down with this lion, they, they will kill this lion. But you know what the lion does? In the midst of this big animal, he will just go, wait, 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 like this. And puts confusion. And all of them will scatter. Then they will isolate one. Because they know that if they go to the whole herd, they will fight, they will kill the lion. So they try to isolate one. As soon as that one is isolated, it's already game for them. So I want to tell you something. That when the devil tells you, ah, don't go for Bible study. What's all this? Wahala? Just You can pray at home now. Forget all those things. You know what he's doing? Isolate her. Quickly, quickly isolate him. Because an isolated Christian is an easy target for demonic forces. It's an easy target. That's why it says, don't neglect the gathering together of yourselves as the manner of some is. God is a wise God. Amen. God is a wise God. Refuse to be isolated. Refuse to allow the devil push you to one corner. Give you reasons why you shouldn't I beg all this Bible study thing. Is it a waste of time? All this court team meeting. Uh -uh, what is it? Okay, he uses isolation. Now, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Thank you, Lord. Are you still here? 
Are you still here or you've gone home? All right, Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 12. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Want to read? So, this is the structure of the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of Satan is a structured kingdom. Very organized. Very organized. Organized for wickedness. Organized for destruction. You know Jesus himself said the thief doesn't come but for to steal. To kill. And to destroy. So it's an organized kingdom for destruction, for killing, for mass execution. He said, we wrestle. But our wrestling is not with flesh and blood. So I see many people, when they're having issues in their lives, they are looking for human beings that they want to hold. You are pursuing girlfriend of your husband. You are pursuing this. You are pursuing that. Waste of time. Waste of time. Our contention is not with flesh and blood. The devil can use flesh and blood, but he, the flesh and blood is not our enemy. Even that flesh and blood that the devil is using is also a victim of the devil. Are you listening to me? The flesh and blood that the devil is using is also a victim of the devil. They are victims. If you see witches and wizards, people that are paralyzed with mummy water spirits, these are all victims of the devil. So they are not our enemies. Our real enemy is the devil who may decide to use one of his victims. So it says we wrestle, but our wrestling is against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So that's our contention against a structured kingdom. But I have good news tonight. Amen. Amen. No matter how structured and organized their kingdom is, Jesus defeated them. Jesus whipped the devil, defeated him, made no sense of him at the cross of Calvary. You know the Bible says that if the prince of darkness had known the wisdom of God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Come on, shout hallelujah. They would not, if they had known the wisdom of God, that that death that Jesus was dying, that cross of Calvary was their undoing, they would never have tried it. So when Jesus went to the cross, he actually went to defeat the devil for me. I didn't know when I defeated the devil for you as well. Because Jesus did not commit any sin. He was not under the control of the devil. In defeating the devil, it was for me. Is it for you? And if I say it's for me, you say it's for me too. And you quickly collect your own. So he defeated the devil for us. I want you to turn your Bibles to Colossians 2. Colossians 2 verse 15. Colossians chapter 2. The devil is a wicked devil. But thank God, our master defeated him. Our senior brother defeated him. Hallelujah. Colossians 2 and verse 15. 2.15. Look at it. It says, everybody read. Praise God. You know, if you watch any of these Roman films, whether Quo Vadis, The Robe, any of these Roman films, you know, in those days when the emperors go to fight and they won the battle, when they are coming back, you will see the captain on top of his chariot like this and then all the slaves that they captured including the king of that foreign nation they will tie them like this and march them through the city triumphing over them in this Colossians 2.15 that's the picture that the Bible is painting that when Jesus defeated the devil it wasn't a private defeat it was not a secret defeat so that the devil will say eh, you, have you ever Seen when two children fight, but it was not a public fight. 
The one when they beat, after call they make man say, I ain't win. I win. But this one, now the devil has no where to make mouth. Because the defeat was a public defeat. The Bible says he triumphed over the devil in it. The devil is defeated. Amen. Amen. So when we talk about spiritual warfare, we are talking about contending in that sense against forces that have already been defeated. That's why Jesus said, occupy till I come. We are not a militant army. We are an occupying army. An occupying army is an army that territory has already been won. My own is to just stand there and enforce victory. Amen. The battle has already been won. The territory has already been taken. I'm just standing there and enforcing victory. I'm saying what was purchased is mine and I take it. Praise God. Oh, come on, shout it better. Hallelujah. Now, please, I want you to go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8b. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8b. Hallelujah. For this purpose, have you found it? For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. What is the purpose? That he might destroy the works of the devil for this purpose. For this purpose. Jesus came to destroy the devil and he destroyed and pata pata. He didn't give him opportunity to raise his head. Amen. The devil was so defeated that he can never rise again. The devil was so defeated that he can never stand up to say, uh, I, I wasn't defeated though. There was Ojoro. There was no Ojoro. Praise God. The devil was totally defeated and Jesus defeated him for you. I didn't hear a good amen. amen. Please, I want you to know that I was telling you the other time of um, the man of God, Lester Sumrall, who went to a, 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 an African village. He was a missionary at that time to preach. And they gave him a little hut. And that was where he was staying. And of course, some of the people he was preaching to, some were not happy because they were all this, uh, they had demonic powers. And he came to spoil their things. So in the night one day, he was lying down on his bed when all of a sudden there was this terrible wild wind. And I saw it happen. Somebody posted something on WhatsApp the other time. I was shocked. Well, not too shocked. These evangelists wanted to have a program. They've already arranged chairs. I don't know how many of you saw that thing. Already arranged chairs. You know that that breeze was not normal. That thing just get wah, 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 wah. Scatter all the chairs of the crusade ground. Scatter all the chairs. You know that this is not normal. So that's the kind of wind that came. Burst into the small hut. And he just jumped from his bed and was watching this thing. Then the bee just went to where his bed was, carried the bed, fling it to the middle of the room. So as he was just he now done on him that no, this is the devil. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, get out of here. And the wind started going. As the wind was going, he just realized that his bed was in the middle of the room. And he said he got angry in his spirit. How can a demon come into my house? Come and give me work this night. In the name of Jesus, come back here. And the wind came. In the name of Jesus, put the bed back where you took it from. Put it back. So now you can clear, get out of here. <laughs> you know what I mean. You get out of here, man. Amen. These things I'm saying, are they for some special Christians? No. Jesus. What's that song? You have fought for me. Defeated. For me, for every single one of us, everyone, every single one, in this kingdom, there are no favorites. You know, when they were defeating the land, they were Gagashites, they were Amorites, they were uh, Canaanites, they were Perisites, they were all kinds of ites. But in this kingdom, we are all favorites. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God doesn't prefer one over another. Don't let the devil tell you that, oh, this one is for those very special Christians. No, so long as you have received Jesus as Lord, it's for you. 
Say a good amen. amen. It's for you. So let's take the last thing tonight. Now, after defeating the devil, he gave us weapons. He gave us weapons to stand our ground because we need weapons to stand our ground. What are the weapons he gave us? Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to look at verse 3. I love it. I love it. I love it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In other words, even though we are human beings walking up and down in this physical body, our warfare is not physical. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So God has given us mighty spiritual weapons. Mighty spiritual weapons. Mighty spiritual weapons. But let me show you what this. Okay, no television. Okay. These weapons, look at the next, verse 5. Look at verse 5. I'm even grateful that they didn't put up this TV. No wonder all of you are reading your Bible this evening. I'm not encouraging anybody to open Bible. It's good. Okay, look at it. Look at it. Verse 5. Casting downwards imaginations and. Now, so you see there's a translation that says these weapons help us to pull down arguments and reasonings in the mind. One of the biggest places of conflict is the mind. Is the mind. The devil comes. The devil comes. The devil comes with thoughts of fear. What of if this do like this? What of if this do like this? Before you over, you are overwhelmed. You are overwhelmed. Thoughts of worry. Your heart begin to, to palpitate, palpitate, and be palpitate. Shaking. And then before you know, you are out of control. And you are wondering what is happening. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty. What are those mighty weapons? Number one, he has given us the name of Jesus. I hope you know the name of Jesus is a powerful weapon. He said, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every, every, without exception. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, his name is a weapon. The name of Jesus is a weapon. I want to say, say the name of Jesus is a weapon. Do you know when you call the name of Jesus in faith? It does damage to the kingdom of darkness. We are not calling it in fear. He's giving us his name. He said, go in my name. Use my name. Use my name. Pull down strongholds. Use my name. Pull down arguments. Use my name. Those of you, you have been stuck in one place in your life. Use the name of Jesus and un un unstuck yourself. Amen. Amen. The name of Jesus is a weapon. What other weapon did he give us? The blood of Jesus. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Plead the blood. Use the blood. Use the blood. The devil cannot stand the blood. There's one, one, one um, a person who was attending one of these spiritual churches. When the person repented, and got over on the correct side. Then he began to understand about the power in the blood of Jesus. He said, no wonder. When they were in that um, spirit, spirit, spiritist church, all those celestial kind of places. He said, what used to surprise him that any time they were singing anything about the blood of Jesus, the demons must react. The demons must react. So they stayed away from singing songs that related to the blood of Jesus Christ. There is power mighty in the blood. There is power mighty in the blood. You don't understand that demons understand what you are talking about. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. It's a weapon. Use it. Use it. Use it. It's a weapon. Don't just act as if you are one helpless person that the devil can come and kick as he likes 
And you say, hey God, why now? Why is my situation like this? Use the weapons. Tell your neighbor, use your weapons. What other weapon did he give us? The word. The word. Amen. When the devil dared to come against Jesus, he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. And that is why we keep begging you in this place to please stay in the word. You can't, you can't fight this warfare without the word of God. You can't. It can't be done. You remember that in the Old Testament, God gave them manna. You remember he gave them manna in the desert. Yeah? And that manna came every single day. They were supposed to go out and collect every single day. I remember that when some people refused the instruction and they went to collect for two days. When they woke up the next day, what happened to the one they collected? Worms had eaten it up because this manna cannot stay till the next day. Every single day you must collect manna. And Jesus was speaking to the Jews. He said, see, you think that it's Moses that gave your father's food in the wilderness. I was that bread that they were eating. I was the bread they were eating daily. They ate me for 40 years and none of them were sick. Their shoes did not, their, their feet did not swell. 40 years in the desert they were eating Christ. They were eating Christ. This warfare cannot be done without the word. That is why the devil tries to keep you from reading the Bible. Don't you understand? It is only when something happened this afternoon. So I sat, I was reading my Bible. As I was reading my Bible, because I, I wanted to read First John. So I read it from the middle to the end, and I started again. I was almost then, I started feeling sleepy. And I, oh, you know how it happens now. I said, okay, enough is enough. Let me go and sleep. When I wake up, I continue. I went to sleep. When I lie down, the sleep come again. The one the devil wants, you must not read this Bible. And that is when you get aggressive. That is when you stand and carry the Bible and be reading and walking. And be speaking it out. And be confessing it. And be declaring it. Because you see, your life depends on it. Your victory depends on it. See how the devil opposes you when you want to study the Bible. And then he brings thoughts to you that, ah, this thing is so boring. I don't even understand when they read. All these pastors, they try, when they feel they explain this thing, you know, now, wow. When they even they preach and say, go, bless I never read Bible once. How many of you feel like that sometimes? <laughs> yeah? You know what? This is the warfare. Amen. Amen. And the Holy Spirit said, fight the good fight of faith. What is the fight of faith? You take hold on this word. You take hold on this word. You take hold on this word. Amen. Amen. So the word is a weapon. Say it. Say the word is a weapon. The last weapon I'll talk to you about is the weapon of prayer. The weapon of prayer. It's a weapon. That's why also the devil tries to contend with you for you not to pray. But I'm not going to dwell in that because I want to stop this message by 6.30 precisely. So let me take the last bit. Hmm. Hallelujah. I said Hallelujah. James chapter 4 verse 7 Are you ready to shout tonight? <laughs> James chapter 4 verse 7 Submit yourselves therefore to God Resist the devil and he shall flee from you The original Greek say he will run from you as one that is terrified he will run away from you as one that is terrified. What did he say you should do? Resist the devil. Did he say you should fight the devil? You see, let me tell you, you cannot fight the devil. You cannot win. He said resist the devil because your king, the Lord Jesus has already defeated him. Your own is to resist him. Satan, I resist you in the name of Jesus. I command you, take your hands off my property. Take your hands off of my health. Take your hands out of my finances. All those of you that are having uh, challenges with your finances, let me tell you simple. See, you open your mouth. Satan, in the name of Jesus, I command you, take your hands out off of my finances in the name of Jesus. Take your hands out of my finances in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for the ministering spirits. Let them go forth to cause the money to come in. Let them cause the money to come in. 
Let them cause the money to come in. Amen. Amen. He said resist the devil. He didn't say discuss with the devil. He didn't say negotiate with the devil. He didn't say tremble at the devil. You know the way some people talk about the devil, eh? you think he's so powerful and Jesus is so weak. That's why sometimes before we allow people to testify here, we listen to what they want to say first. Because some people, oh, if they come here, all of us go shock. Not be smart, you know. They put on the pursue me, pursue me, I don't know the wrong sins. Yes. You and the devil are supposed to be in a race, but it's not the devil that's supposed to be pursuing. It's you pursuing him, and he's the one that is running away. Amen. He's the one that's supposed to be doing the running, not you. Resist the devil, he shall flee. How many of you are ready to resist him tonight? Yeah, one more scripture. One more scripture. I'll give you an opportunity. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. Verse 8. First Peter 5 verse 8. Just sitting down and complaining how this is this, this is this, this is it's not, it's not, that's not a recipe. You get up and do what you are supposed to do. First Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, that's your enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast. How? In the faith. Resist him steadfastly. But you need to resist him in the faith. You need to resist him in the faith. You know, they say, and they go, they go, hmm, hmm. It's how to resist the devil. In the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. Take your hands off of my mind in the name of Jesus. Some of you struggling with thoughts in your mind that are not Christian. And you just allow it. Can I again make a statement? He says, see, you cannot stop a bird from flying across your head. But you can stop a bird from building a nest on your head. You can't allow the devil to start making you think of all sorts of rubbish thoughts in your mind and you sit with it. No, I resist you, Satan. My mind is not for junk. I have a renewed mind. I have the mind of Christ. Amen. And you resist him in the faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And that means that you have put the word of God in your spirit. Put the word of God in your spirit. Put the word of God in your spirit. I'll show you two more scriptures. We'll close. Are you here? I love it. First John chapter 5 verse 4. First John 5 4. First John 5 4. Everybody, if you find it, I want all of us to read it together. First John chapter 5 verse 4. One, two, read. What overcomes the world? Whatever is born of God. How many of you are born of God? The Bible says you overcome the world. When it talks about the world, it's talking about the devil and all his structures. Whatever is born of God, you are a born overcomer. Overcoming is in your DNA. When you got born again, part of what Jesus deposited in your spirit is an overcoming mind. So I don't know why. This habit is just holding me. Resist it. Resist it. Resist it. Apostle Paul said, All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. I will not allow anything to control me. Even if that thing is coke, I will not allow it. So I, I, I don't want to drink coke. Then something says, You must drink coke. You must drink coke. If you don't drink coke, your body goes to shape. That's when we, we, we say goodbye. I will not be controlled by anything. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Go to 1 John 4 4. Everybody read 1 John 4 4 and get ready to pray for five minutes. 1 John 4 4. Have you find, found it? One, two, read. Are you ready to shout? He said, You are. Of God, little children, and you have overcome. You are not trying to overcome them. 
Look, please look at your position. Please, what is your position? Are you trying to overcome them? Who are you? Who are you? He said you have overcome them. All the wishes and the lizards, you have overcome them. All the powers of darkness are arrayed against you, you have overcome them. All the demonic entities that have been released to say this one will not enter their destiny, you have overcome them. Why have you overcome them? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The greater one is in you. Stand on your feet and shout, the greater one is in me. Shout it one more time, the greater one is in me. One more time, the greater one is in me. I am an overcomer. I am an overcomer. I am victorious. In Christ Jesus, I am victorious. For one minute, I want you to lift your hands and thank Jesus for making you an overcomer. Give him praise tonight. I want to hear your voice as you thank him in this place. Thank him in this place. Thank him in this place. Thank him for making you an overcomer tonight. Please thank him. Thank him. Thank him. That's what he has made you. That's what he has made you. They may surely gather together and say, it's not of me. Thank him because you are more than a conqueror through him that loved you. If you are a child of God here, I want you to thank the Lord. If you are a child of God here, let it come from your hearts. In Jesus name now I want you to use the remaining two minutes to take your position take your position and I want you to open your mouth and come against everything the devil has released at this material time against you against any area of your life open your mouth and resist Jesus. 
Blessed be your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we have prayed. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. Please, as our eyes are closed, very quickly, if you are here tonight and you have not fully given your heart to Jesus Christ, the thing about it is that that means you are still under the control of the devil. You cannot bind the devil, you are under his control. If tonight you say, I want to repent, I really want to be a child of God, put up your hand, let me pray for you quickly. I want to repent, I really want to be a child of God. Anybody want to give you a chance before we close? Anybody? Anybody? Father, thank you. Thank you, God, for speaking to us tonight. We leave this place with faith in our hearts. We leave this place knowing who we are. Pastor Vera Oroba has just placed in your hands the key to all-round abundance and unlimited life in Christ. The end has come to all your struggles in Jesus' name. Come worship with us at Morning Star Christian Center, Ephraim. God bless you.